Thank you, Frank. Dear parents, family, faculty, and graduates, there are different cultural traditions across the world regarding graduation speeches, and I have not been invited to give many, so I was very nervous. <laughs> so the European Convention seems to start by telling a joke, and in Africa, especially if it's a politician, they start by apologizing for being late. <laughs> so let me start by apologizing for not being late and for not having a joke. <laughs> Uh, I should also say, though, that uh, I had some good intelligence from the MIP class telling me that the two student speakers that will follow me, Skylar and Maya, are significantly more funny than me, so I shouldn't even try to go there. <laughs> I also want to assure you that I'm not going to pull a Harrison Butker on you and will not be making points made by the Canton City Chiefs player in his now famous graduation speech, where he suggested especially that women graduates' main role in life is to be homemakers, nor will I be criticizing a woman's right to choose uh, or the need to respect the rights of the LGBTI community. As we celebrate not just your academic milestone, we acknowledge the journey you have taken to get here. The late night study sessions, the moments of doubt and hard choices, and the countless memories are all part of what makes this day special for you as an MIP graduate. This is especially so given the global mental health and well-being crises that we have with eco-anxiety and climate anxiety and the difficult atmosphere on campuses as students deal with divisions associated with addressing the pain of what is happening in Palestine and Israel, as well as growing polarization here in the United States and abroad. Looking out at this beautiful assembled group, looking very fashionable in their gowns. <laughs> By the way, I've not often worn this, so I'm as nervous as you about wearing this. <laughs> uh, you have dedicated early years of your life to mastering the dynamics and nuances of policy and governance on an international <coughs> level. Your commitment to developing this vital expertise is a testament to your empathy, your intellectual courage, and your vision for creating a more just and equitable world for all its people. It takes a certain intellectual fortitude to be willing to steep yourselves in dense history and details of all that has happened and keeps happening across the world. It takes focus and discipline to do it. It also takes a lot to roll up your sleeves and get out there to push forward with the vision of the world you want to see. As a human rights and environmental activist, I have some lived experience of how important this is, as well as how difficult it can be. Remember, it's not the easy moments that define us, but the challenges we overcome that make us stronger. The pessimism of our analysis, our lived experience, and our observations can best be overcome by the optimism of the creativity of our thoughts, our actions, and our courage. The truth is that our world has never had a greater need for principal leaders and thinkers like yourselves. Oppression, inequality, and injustice still cast far too long of a shadow across humanity and the systems we have designed for our existence. That's why the work you've prepared for through this program is absolutely vital in the struggle for universal human dignity. You now find yourselves in an extraordinarily privileged position, carrying the great gifts of knowledge and a world-class education from Stanford. With that privilege comes an awesome responsibility to uplift the human condition, however you can, in whatever sphere or influence your unique talents and passions allow. Now we have to ask how we deploy the privilege for the benefit of all those around us, including family and society. Finding a balance between these two is something one must do for themselves. It is a personal question with a personal answer. In deploying skills from Stanford, you have a challenge to use your knowledge to either on the one hand to tend to broken systems 
so that what should be discarded is discarded and new thinking and innovation is embraced. On the other hand, if you have come to the view that the time for incremental tinkering with broken systems has long since passed, you could instead focus more on using your talents to build, advocate, reimagine and create different systems, whether they be energy systems, transport systems or economic systems themselves. Yet, this is the most challenging question you may encounter. Many among you might want to take your skills and address specific questions about using your talents to do human rights work, climate justice work, gender justice work, or some other area of public purpose. You will need to make those decisions choosing an area of intervention that you find joyful and fulfilling. I invite you all to expand your horizons and embrace your sense of pleasure and play as you do so. In that way, you'll be reassured to remain forever young, if not in age, but in freshness of thought, perspective, and reflection. We need to recognize that the biggest challenge facing those that are seeking positive social change is the ability or the inability to effectively communicate to large enough numbers of people fast enough and urgently enough. And this is what has brought me to strongly believe that the transformational change our world desperately needs can effectively reach through our creativity. Go, therefore, into the world and offer your creativity to the way things are done in the places you will find yourself in. Through your creativity, touch hearts, build connections, and shift perspectives towards the change you want to see in the world. You'll be taking your skills into a world that is undergoing major challenges and where we have defective organizations, defective governments, defective leaders. In the real world of employment, you will not find perfect organizations. And your challenge is to go into these organizations with an openness to learn and contribute, but making sure you don't lose your heart and your values in the process. Be ready to stand creatively maladjusted, as Martin Luther King advised us in the mid-1960s, to all forms of injustice and remain away, aware of ways in which we become complicit in abusive and violent systems of power. When you go into your jobs, you will deal with conventions that are the norm and you'll have to find the immensely difficult balance between complying with the rules on the one hand and maintaining open perspectives that push institutional boundaries towards your values and beliefs. I urge you to embrace a culture of emergence because while we might know the broad direction we'd like to see society take, such as greater gender equality, fewer harmful greenhouse gas emissions, demilitarization, and so on, it doesn't mean that we need to be arrogant to believe we have all the details on how to get there. Knowing the broad direction is important, but having an openness and a sense of belief that through co-creation with all parts of society, the best possible outcomes can emerge. You might have seen the speech of Shruti Kumar, a young Harvard graduate which went, vital, uh, went viral a few weeks ago. She celebrates the power of not knowing, what I have previously called the tyranny of knowing, and recognizing that there will always be bodies of knowledge that we will not have a full grasp of in the turbulent and fluid world we find ourselves in. Don't underestimate the power of humility, the power of curiosity, the power of being comfortable with the reality that as humanity stands at this precarious moment in history, there are many challenges before us for which we do not have detailed solutions. Willingness to acknowledge this opens up more doors for exploration and hopefully more innovative solutions. In a world filled with conflict and division, cultivate kindness as a core value. The positive impact you can leave through compassion for others will be an enduring legacy. And never lose sight of the value in nurturing relationships, the friendships, mentorships and family bonds you have formed here and continue shaping your path forward. Life's journey won't always unfold as planned. But it's not about how 
many times you stumble. It's about summoning the resilience to get back up, shake off the dust, and charge ahead with renewed determination. Don't be afraid to take calculated risks and push past your comfort zones. The greatest achievements and personal growth often come from boldly venturing into the unknown. I have learned from many years of involvement in struggles for justice that even the most deeply entrenched injustice and oppression can be overcome. Systemic racism, economic exploitation, apartheid, misogyny, gender justice, and so on, these are all human constructs manufactured by greed and fear and sustained by apathy. And they all can be dismantled to the courageous effort of engaged people demanding change. Students throughout the world are standing up against the legacy of slavery and colonialism that still prevails. The polarization that we are seeing in far too many countries, the rise of fascism, failures of, illiberal democracy, of liberal democracies, genocide, oppression, armed conflict, and illegal occupation are all part of the difficult context through which you will enter working life. Whatever your standpoint is, your duty is to bring fresh perspectives to old problems. Right now, across this nation and around the globe, there's a riding tide of moral activism. Young people are shaking ossified power structures to the core through passionate protests. They are demanding action on climate change, pushing for human rights for those living under oppression and armed conflict, and fighting racist oppression in all its insidious forms. These activists should be embraced in the struggle for universal uni uh, human dignity. And they are looking to you to wield your privilege in service of the many causes that need our attention. To make an impact and create positive change in whatever ways your skills and conviction allow. The world goes, the world's hopes go with you now as you enter the world of work. But before you embark on the next phase of life, take a moment to express gratitude to those who helped pave the way. You are not here solely because of your efforts. And here I want to pay tribute to all the family members, especially parents, and maybe there are one or two grandparents even here, friends, mentors, and extraordinary faculty here at, at Stanford. Their belief and support have been integral to your reaching this important milestone. So if you will just bear with me, I've tried this at South African graduation ceremonies and they've worked, I hope it will work here. So can I ask all the friends, family, faculty, and mentors to please stand? And can I ask all the graduates, I will join you to put your hands to say a very, very good thank you. Can I now just swap it around and ask all the graduates to stand? <laughs> and let's put our hands together to say a very big congratulations. To you. Thank you. Thank you. So, in conclusion, let this commencement ceremony be a true beginning, the spark that ignites your lifelong fire to learn, to engage, to empathize, to fearlessly speak truth to power. Allow the echoes of the oppressed to be your moral compass, guiding you in channeling your remarkable education toward lightening the crushing burdens of poverty, discrimination, and environmental and economic injustice. You have the capability to be boundary crossers, paradigm shifters, advocates for human ascendancy over the weary forces that have far too long impeded our world's social and moral progress. The family of Stanford Changemakers now has the opportunity to contribute towards reshaping our global community into becoming more equitable, more compassionate, more worthy of the human spirit's eternal yearning for freedom. I want to leave you with a personal story from my youth. Today, 
those of you who know South Africa will know it's a very important day in South Africa. It's National Youth Day. And this commemorates a massacre of hundreds of students by the apartheid regime in 1976. And I want to also acknowledge a close friend of mine called Lenny Naidu, same surname, no relation. I want to reflect on the last conversation I had with Lenny before we both would flee South Africa into exile when we were 22 year olds. He asked me the, a question just before we would flee in different directions. He was a very philosophical guy and always asked very philosophical questions. He said, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the course of justice? I replied, well, that's an easy question. That's giving your life. And he said, you mean, <coughs> you mean going partisan, participating in a demonstration, getting shot and killed and being, um, becoming a martyr? I said, I guess so, because at that time in South Africa on a daily basis, people were being murdered by the apartheid regime for standing up against the injustice of apartheid. However, Lenny looked at me and he said, that's the wrong answer. It's not about giving our life. It's about giving the rest of our life. I was 22 years old that time. My friend Lenny was way ahead of me. I don't know what he was talking about. Uh, in fact, I jokingly say that he at that time was probably one of 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. He was one of the few people who got the intersection between environmental justice and racial justice. The distinction Lenny was making between giving your life and giving the rest of your life was simply saying that the struggle for justice is not a sprint, but a marathon. And the biggest sacrifice anyone can make is to be true to those values until those injustices have been overcome. I received news of Lenny's assassination as a 22-year-old student in exile. There were so many bullets in his body, the pa his parents would not be able to recognize him at the mortuary. I tell the story not to depress you, but to actually summon in you a sense of the capability that ordinary people have to make extraordinary change. On, the on, the, on June 8th, just a few days ago, was the 36th anniversary of Lenny's murder by the apartheid regime. And I'm pleased to spend it in remembrance with people who are seeking to imagine a different future based on a true sense of global justice. I feel his eyes on you all today, and I wish you all to remember his powerful words. The struggle for justice is a marathon and not a sprint. Take care of yourselves to be able to run this marathon and pace yourselves. The world is now yours. Play your role in looking after it well and leave it better, more just, and a more sustainable play place than you found it. Congratulations once again to the Stanford Masters in International Policy Class of 2024. Thank you very, very much.